Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Welcome into the program everyone. We have a great show for you today where we have an interview with the one, the only, Pedego Electric Bikes. If you haven't heard about e-bikes, uh, where have you been for the past, you know, five, six, seven, eight years? The field has really, um, you know, really kicked it into overdrive. They've, um, you know, Electric bikes, much like electric cars, have really hit the mainstream, and the benefits have been seen by a lot of people, companies, and hey, uh, they're you know they're almost as ubiquitous as cars in some major cities. It's really incredible, and we have a great company to talk to us about the industry, what how it's been developing, and why you should really be paying attention to hey maybe getting an e-bike. It's um, you know something that you should really pay attention to. Now before we get started, Computer America. That's where you'll we'll find everything, including past shows, future shows, show notes, a link to our guest website will we'll remain on the homepage there for the next 10 days or so. You can catch it there if you're driving, if you're listening to us on the go. Don't worry, everything will be available on our website. Of course, you're more than welcome to go to pedego.com yourself. Check out their products, check out the service. But uh, yeah, in the meantime, Computer America, that's all you need to remember. Now, with uh, morning announcements done, let's go ahead and get started with our interview. And I'm really happy to have on with us Mr. Don DiCostanzo. He is the CEO of Pedego Electric Bikes. And Don, Thank you for taking the time. Welcome on to the program. Hi, Ben. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, our pleasure, our pleasure. And, uh, you know, we always love really interviewing, uh, you know, not just CEOs, but product managers and just anyone who can uh, really break down a complex topic to, a, uh, I'm sorry, a complex complex topic for us. There we go. Wow. Words are hard today. But uh, yeah, before we get started, let's get a bit of background on yourself. Have you always been in tech, um, you know, or are you more of a fitness guy? I mean, how, uh, and of course, a little bit of background on Pedego as well. How did this all start? Well, first of all, I've never been in tech. Um, I was an eco-terrorist <laughs> and now I consider myself an ecopreneur. And by that, I mean, I started out most of my career in the automotive industry. My family owned a chain of car dealerships in Boston. I worked for an automotive chemical company, and I owned at one point 40 car washes. So it was wow. all pretty much circled around the, the automotive transportation by automobile. Um, in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2006, I discovered electric bikes. Um, I bought several of them in 2006. In 2007, I decided to open up an electric vehicle store. And in that store, I offered uh, electric scooters, mm -hmm. electric skateboards, electric car called the Zen electric car out of Canada, Z-E-N-N. -N. They're now defunct. But uh, and I had electric golf cart. I had like the Cadillac Hummer or the Cadillac Escalade, the Hummer and a 32 Ford Roadster. And I offered electric bikes. And I quickly discovered that electric bikes were where it was at. People bought them in pairs. They loved them. They had recreation. And they were relatively easy to maintain. On the other end of the spectrum, the electric golf carts were a nightmare because they were hard, clumsy to haul around. Not that many people wanted to buy them. Mm -hmm. and it didn't look like that was going to replace transportation in the near future. And what happened in 2008 um, the, the, the real drag on electric bikes, by the way, electric bikes were first patented in 1897. Really? So they're not new. And people asked me if I invented the electric bike. I said, I don't think so. I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> and I like to think I perfected them. And by perfected them, a lot of things converged to allow the technology to take it to the next level. The main convergence was the, uh, the, the battery. The battery went from uh, uh, lead acid batteries, which weighed a ton, 
to lithium ion batteries. And that's what transformed the electric car world as well. There were plenty of people who tried electric cars in the 90s, General mm -hmm. Motors being at the top of the list and failed. The battery technology wasn't there. Same thing in electric bikes. Lee Iacocca tried to sell electric bikes in the late 90s, 1997 to 2002, when he ultimately went bankrupt. Um, he had $50 million invested between he and his friends. And uh, the company didn't all? succeed because they were ahead of the time. It's called EV Global Motors. You can Google it. It's called the EV, uh, EV Global Warrior was the product that they offered. Now, um, in 2006, when I bought my first electric bikes, I did a big study on the industry to see, well, why did Lee Iacocca fail? And in 2007, when I had the retail store, I began to realize that nobody had quite figured out electric bikes yet. Mm -hmm. And I figured I could do it better. So in 2008, I uh, started Pedigo. And uh, with the idea that we would only offer electric bikes with lithium ion batteries. The other thing about electric bikes back in that day is they were grossly underpowered. They were typically 24 volt systems and with 250 watt motors. Well, I went to 36 volt right away and uh, 500 watt motors. And then pretty soon I found out that wasn't enough. So mm -hmm. we went to 48 volt systems with uh, 500 watt motors. And that was kind of the magic sauce. What so, what do you think was and and, and obviously you know uh, when you were doing it, what were some of the key benchmarks that you kind of re remember from that time that you really wanted uh, people to have? Like, was it a certain amount of range? Was it you know kind of the certain amount of like horsepower to get people up hills? I mean, what were some of the key you know metrics that you wanted to push? In, in that one year that I had a retail store, I really learned what the customer wanted. Okay, and I'm always customer focused. What does the customer want? Not what does the industry think? What do I think? What does the customer want? The two things I learned. Number one, the men want to know two questions. How far do they go and how fast will it go? That's what the <laughs> men want to know. The women want to know what colors do they come in? <laughs> there you so, go. So um, I discovered very quickly, and in 2008, when I began the vision in the perfect product line, it was something that they went far. They went fast and they came in lots of different colors. And in 2009, when Pedigo started selling its first products, we sold 444 bikes that year. They were colorful and they were fast and they went a long range. Um, but the battery technology had just then been uh, launching. And you know, if you think back to when Tesla got their launch and things that happened, lithium changed the game. Now, before we jump too far forward, I want to back right. up a little bit to why Lee Iacocca failed in 1997 to 2002. Go for it. He failed for uh, several reasons, and each one of them would have killed any company. And when it came to the style of the bikes, they were ugly. No other way to describe them. They were just ugly. Okay, So <laughs> nothing against Lee. He since has passed away, but he was uh, uh, in his, his, uh, his daughter lives next to one of our customers. And the customer called me up uh, several years ago and said, you're not going to believe this, but Lee Iacocca just looked at the two pedagogues on the back of my car and looked over and said, that's electric bikes done right. Those <laughs> were his words. Okay. And I, I took that as a huge, uh, yeah. a huge uh, compliment to what we've done at Pedigo. So the bikes were ugly. So that, that's one reason people don't generally buy ugly products. The second reason he failed is that he was ahead of his time. The market wasn't ready for electric bikes yet. They didn't have the right technology and everything. The third reason he failed, he tried to sell them to car dealerships. Okay. And car dealerships do not, did not prove and have not proved to be a successful place to sell electric bikes. And many have tried and many have failed. Just last week, Porsche announced they were buying an electric bike company. Hmm. We did the license agreement for Ford Motor Company for there. We, we, we made bikes for Ford and they tried to sell them to dealers. I went to the National Automobile Dealer Show. We sold, we had zero success working with car dealers. And we had four, all the four dealers at our beck and call. They bought them from themselves, but nobody bought them to resell them. So it just really doesn't fit. A lot yeah. of other companies have come out with bikes as kind of a marquee thing to hang on their parts store. But as far as volume of electric bikes or bikes, in fact, doesn't work through car dealerships. Um, the, the fourth reason he failed was because the, um, the, uh, the, the, Price was too high for the value. They were too expensive. People want to buy a listen. Back in that day, I think his bikes were two thousand dollars. Today, that's not too high of a price, but back then it was too. So they were too expensive. So all right. those reasons I had to consider. And when we launched our bike, our our bike started at nine ninety five, and they went as high as fourteen ninety five. 
that was kind of the start of entry level price. So that gave us some traction. So we kind of checked all the boxes as far as uh, as far as being successful. So 2009 we launched. 2010, 11, 12 we tried to find our way into the distribution system for bicycle shops, and they disdained us. They would throw us out. They would tell us it's not a bicycle. They would say is that why would you take a perfect good bicycle and ruin it by putting a motor on it? And that somehow, if you couldn't ride and pedal like we do, you're not entitled to ride a bike. It was a very arrogant, uh, yeah. uh, ignorant, ignorant attitude, I think, not having ever ridden one themselves. We still get that to this day, believe it or not. Some of the hardcore cyclists will still um, will still not want to claim that electric bikes have a place in society. I've got a cousin who's a very uh, avid cyclist, and he doesn't want anybody to know I'm his cousin because he thinks that somehow that will <laughs> embarrass him. We we uh we had a correspondent on the show and and he was an older gentleman, but he had an entire section dedicated on his site to uh you know to electric bikes because you know so many of his readers and you know kind of um, colleagues they could get out and enjoy the outdoors, go to parks, you know, thanks to electric bikes. Like it, it was, uh, like not so much accessibility, you know, not like a wheelchair or something like that, but just something that could give people the the freedom to go 20, you know, 20, 25 miles at a time where before they think, Oh, you know, I, I, I will never do that again. And, you know, I, yeah, maybe some people see electric bikes as cheating, but man, it, it gets so many more people into biking and outdoors. It's great. I've just read some statistics this morning out of the bike industry. The bike industry has been on decline for the past 20 years, okay? There's less and less people riding bikes. We don't learn as a kid. We do that. So you'd think the industry would like something to buoy them up, but they really don't. Uh, they're just happy having the bike pass to themselves. You know, we hear <laughs> all kinds of stories from the traditional cyclists. Um, oh, the people who ride those electric bikes, they're inexperienced, so they're dangerous. Really? Inexperienced? Didn't you start out inexper inexperienced? Everybody's inexperienced. When right. Like, and, and the bike paths are going to get too crowded. Well, you know what? We'll build more bike paths then. We'll make wider bike paths. That's like saying we can't allow any more cars on the road because there's too much traffic. I mean, mm -hmm. just the some of the uh, what I would call illogical arguments were obviously built on passion and ignorance and nothing to do with the facts. But the facts are this. Um, only about 5 or 10% of the entire population in the United States rides a bike on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And the reason for the variance, because you can define regular basis any way you want. I define it ride the bike more than 12 times a year, once a month. I would call that a regular cyclist, okay? It's 10% or less. So that's fine. And if you guys don't want to ride electric bikes, no problem. Uh, what about the other 90%? What about the people who don't ride a bicycle because A, they don't have the energy level, B, mm -hmm. they don't have the stamina, C, they don't have the uh, the the the, uh, the, uh, the strength in their legs. Some people uh, might might, might just bike. not find it fun to pedal the bike, you know, just. Uh, and that's yeah. the secret. They just don't think it's fun. So the main reason people don't uh, ride bikes anymore is a four letter word. It's called a hill. <laughs> if we could go uh, downhill all the time, we'd all love riding bikes. Well, the fact is, if you buy an electric bike, you're going to ride downhill all the time. Mm -hmm. And anybody who owns one will tell you that riding an electric bike is more fun going up the hill than it is down a hill. Now, you tell me mm -hmm. one traditional cyclist. By the way, we call them acoustic cycles. Yeah. Because like acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because the same <laughs> argument was made against electric guitars. We bring technology into it. Um, how many guitarists or bands do you go see today that play an acoustic guitar and don't have an electric guitar? I'd just like you to name one. Yeah, th there, there's some purists out there, but clearly, uh, you know, time has kind of won that battle as well. Uh, so so Bob, you, Dylan, you, Bob Dylan introduced the electric guitar mm -hmm. and everybody poo-pooed him. The whole industry did the thing. An electric guitar was introduced and Bob Dylan was the first one that carried it away and said, this is the way to go. This is the future. And everybody poo pooed him for how many years, and it went full circle. The other See, one but who even Snow remembers Bob Dylan's name nowadays? But okay, that aside, and that was a joke, obviously. But uh, I, I will say that uh, you know to kind of get so you laid you know amazing groundwork. Electric bikes have been on you know kind of on the rise, and it's still something that a lot of people need to discover. I wanted you to kind of talk about uh, over the past couple of years. There's been uh, there's been a pandemic. It's crazy, but uh, people are looking for ways to get out 
outdoors to exercise. You know, we've all been locked up. Uh, how are the trends? You know, uh, are people not buying bikes altogether? I know that, you know, maybe just uh, casual spending probably has de- uh, declined. But how has the e-bike community responded to the pandemic? Well, so so that's a great question. What what really transpired is from 2009 till 2019, we grew our business by 20 or 30 percent every year until 2019. In 2019, it flatlined. There were a lot of oppressors. We raised prices. There were all, all kinds of issues. And 2019 was flatlined. 2020, the beginning of 2020, got scary. The whole outdoor recreation business fell flat on its face January, February, March of 2020. Mm-hmm. Come along late March, all of a sudden the world is shut down. Pandemic shut shut everything down. They shut us down, the businesses, everything got shut down. And uh, about three weeks later, bicycles were declared as essential transportation. So they allowed mm-hmm. certain businesses to open back up. And we were fortunate to be one of them. Um, it started here in California. Then it went around the country and said, okay, cycling makes sense. It's outdoor. And in fact, I came up with the idea that our bikes are STVs social distancing vehicles. Now, my marketing department didn't like that because it sounded too much like so, you know, STV, yeah. sexually transmitted. So we didn't use it, but I wish I had in retrospect. Sometimes the marketing department's not always right. <laughs> um, but a bicycle by its definition, whether it be electric or otherwise, is a perfect social distancing vehicle. You're always got a, you know, you're moving along, the air is moving. And when people realized they were going to be in lockdown, they began buying all types of outdoor recreational products, including electric bikes. Really? Now, most, including the industry, thought it would be short-lived. And they believed, well, this is just a, a little spike. And, uh, you know, come around in the fall, this is all going to be diminished. And I, I would have to say that I wasn't certain about that, but I believed that that might, in fact, be the case. However, I decided that we had an order then for the following year I decided there's a chance that this craze just might consider. So I doubled down and ordered a lot of product in fall of 2020. And thank God I did because in 2021, nobody had enough bicycles, electric bicycles or otherwise. The industry was caught flat footed. And but we had plenty. So our business grew 90 percent in uh, 2021 over 2020. Very and impressive. We started the climb in 2020. So. Um, it took off, but the only one the people were take, take advantage of it are people that had ordered in because there's a long lead time in supply chain. So we were able to capitalize on that and open uh, almost double the number of stores we had. People then had an interest in opening up stores. And we now have, I think we're going to close the year with 200 retail pedago stores that allow people to go in and try them. And I think that was the secret too to our success was it wasn't just come on, hurry up and buy buy a, buy an electric bike. Everybody mm-hmm. should buy an electric bike. I say no, don't buy an electric bike. You're crazy. Go <laughs> rent one first. See if there it's you. for you. Try it out. Taste it. You go to Costco. They give you the crackers and the cheese. You try the crackers and the cheese. You like it? You go down the aisle. You buy the crackers and the cheese and put it in your cart. I say the same things with electric bikes. Try them. Don't go run out and buy one. Go try them. Go rent one. Rent one for an hour. Rent one for a day. Rent one for a week. Find the right one that's the right size for you. Because like everything in technology, whether it be a PC or a phone or anything, not one size doesn't fit all. Well, it's even mm-hmm. more important with an electric bike because you've got to be, you've got to fit on it. You've got to feel comfortable on it. It's got to be the right size, if not for nothing else, but for safety sake. That's, uh, you know, that's kind of been the way that uh, traditional or acoustic bikes have been that you go in and you size them and, you know, get a, get a seat and, you know, just kind of customize them to fit you in the way that you ride. Um, but I, I was actually uh, going to ask you because there is a massive supply chain shortage and chip shortage in particular, uh, you know, very, very fortuitous that you kind of ordered ahead of time because man, that's, uh, that's been plaguing cars, uh, you know, car companies. They said that there's going to be a shortage of cars and, you know, a bunch of different uh, equipment. Uh, have you noticed anything with your supply chains and chip shortages? Yeah, so the same thing is happening to us that's happening in the automotive industry. Um, the most expensive uh, cars are the hardest to come by. Uh, if you try to buy a Cadillac Escalade at the Cadillac dealer, they're most expensive. They get a twenty-five dollars or $30,000 premium for them. Um, in the case of bikes, the same thing is true. The higher end, the more expensive bikes, these seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 electric bikes, mm-hmm. we ran out a long time ago. We're not going to see them for a while. We can't get the components. 
However, the less expensive bike, like our Element and our mainstream bikes, we can get all the components we want. The chip shortage has had a small impact on us, but we ordered many more bikes than, than we ended up getting, but we ordered so many that we got a bunch in. So you see all the different examples of the models we have. We actually have 18 different models and they come in different sizes and different colors. And this is important back to my original statement that's saying, hey, people like colors. Like the adventure bike there, the element you're looking at, that comes in six different colors. That fortunately only comes in one size. It only right. has to come in one size because it's really adjustable. And that's a kind of our, 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 our entry level bike. It's the uh, it's the it's only eighteen ninety five and it's got free financing with it. Comes with a couple different battery choices you can add on um, uh, fenders or a light or a, a rack for the back and kind of make it your own and pick the color you like. Um, it looks very rugged, and 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 you know maybe that's something that people don't uh, also kind of uh, think about when it comes to e bikes is that maybe they're fragile, you know they're kind of dinky and that kind of thing. But I mean the you know this this element itself is uh, it's fat tire and it looks. It looks bulky and, and not a, not not like a bad heavy way, but in like a this thing can probably take you anywhere and even up a mountain. Well, yeah, and that's that's a, that's a forty eight volt system, so it's really powerful because it's got such a small rear motor, twenty inch wheel. It's really torquey. And uh, my banker uh, was our banker for six years, and finally he came into me last Christmas and says, "Okay, Don, I'm ready to buy three Pedagos." I said, "Which one? <laughs> I want three elements." One for my 16-year-old, one for my 18-year-old, and one for me. And he was in last week getting a, a, a tire and a tube for it. And he told me that um, his friends have, they all have electric bikes now, 16-year-old. And they all call his Pedigo the Tesla of, <laughs> of, of, of electric bikes. And I said, well, why do they call it that? He says, because it's got ludicrous mode. You hit that throttle and boom, that, that bike takes off. And that is true. We've built performance in there. Remember they said the, the guys ask us how fast do they go and how far they go? Mm -hmm. A lot of times they judge how fast it goes. They're all limited to 20 miles an hour by law. So they all go 20. It's how fast you get to 20 that makes the difference. Just like on a ludicrous mode, how fast you get to 60 or 80 miles an hour in a, in a, in a Tesla. Same thing's true with our bike. They take off like a rocket ship. We got a lot of action and we're a legitimate 500 watt motor, not peak performance. Some of our competitors the way these wattage are motored are based on, uh, you know, uh, normal performance and peak performance. Ours are 500 watt normal performance, 750 watt peak performance. Mm -hmm. A lot of our competitors will offer, say, they're 500 watt, but they're only 500 peak, which means our butt, our bikes will kick their butts. Have you ever timed one, you know, kind of the, the, the zero to 20 on your fastest the, the, bike? The maybe? problem with timing a bike is it all depends on the weight of the rider. Uh -huh. So a number of years ago, there was a, a, a competition uh, at a bike festival and they said, we're going to have a race on electric bikes. It'll be timed race. So everybody based on their time. So they sent them around a track and it will be timed. So all of our competitive bike companies took their lightest rider <laughs> and they put them on one of their, what I would call anemic bikes. I put a 300 pound rider on ours. And since there were no rules, I put him on a 2000 watt motor bike. He kicked everybody's ass. Those cyclists were sore and mad and angry and there were no rules. So they're, they're, they cheated by putting a light rider on there. I cheated by putting a big, powerful motor on it. and we won. we run the thing and they were all humiliated. We haven't seen a race since. Yeah, it's uh, I'm, and really, it sounds a lot like uh, jockeys and, and horse racing and, and that kind of thing. Exactly. So. Yeah, it has a lot to do with the rider. That is yeah. a true statement. So, okay. and really, at the end of the day, it's not about racing. It's about you said it early. It's about fun. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who buy our bikes are buying them for fun. Now, since yeah. gas prices have gone up and the economy looks like it's going to take a turn, a lot of people now are buying them as alternate transportation. We've had several, many, many cases of people get rid of a car. And get a couple of electric, get a couple of pedagos instead. And the reason is, is because there's no insurance, there's no maintenance, there's no gas. It's like a very, very inexpensive form of transportation. And there's physical and mental benefits. So now, everybody some, gets the physical benefits, but not right. everybody gets the mental benefits. But I had yeah. one woman tell me that she calls her pedago her Prozac on two wheels <laughs> because since she started riding her pedago she doesn't need to take prozac anymore and that that's pretty that's a pretty it's pretty it, uh impressive thing to say 
fresh air, relaxing, take a little more time to get where you're going. But hey, you know, you have fun while you're doing it. Uh, I'm sure that exactly. there's a lot of benefits like that. I'm, I'm curious, you know, and you have some here that look like beach cruisers. You, of course, had the element that we saw earlier. Uh, let's say someone who wanted to use this as their main mode of, let's say, commuting. What would a typical range, uh, you know, that you kind of recommend? Like, you know, anyone within 15 miles of their place of work or school or something? Or what's a range people should well, consider? Um, so first of all, the range depends on the battery, uh, mm -hmm. but on our city commuter bike or our cruiser bike, we make a 52 volt, 17.5 amp hour battery, which will take you about 75 miles on a charge wow. without pedaling. Now, if you had pedaling, it's almost unlimited. So people say, how far will the bike take me? And today I can confidently say further than you want to go. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and if you wanted to recharge, if you wanted to go further, you have two options. You could carry an extra battery with you, which only weighs about eight or 10 pounds, or you could carry the charger with you, which weighs about two pounds, and you could charge it when you stop because you're not going to ride 75 miles. So that battery you're looking at there has got blinkers, brake lights, and it's got a big, bright, bold light for nighttime riding and for daytime riding. Very, it weighs very about cool. 10 pounds. That battery would take almost any rider at least 60 to 75 miles without pedaling. If so, you're lighter weight, if you weigh, yep. you know, if you weigh 120 pounds, it'll take you 100 miles. If you weigh two, <laughs> 300 pounds, it might only take you 50 miles, but it'll definitely transport you plenty far. Gotcha. Yeah, no, they, um, the, the technology has definitely come a long way. Like you were mentioning, uh, you know, the 80s and 90s weren't, uh, the battery technology was not there. It seems like it's, um, you know, it's really, it really has developed. And let's face it, lithium ion is a kind of a known figured out technology. It's, it's great and it's cheap and it's, you know, it, it works amazingly. Uh, in well, the let, next, me, let me just add one thing about yeah. the batteries since you have it on the screen. This is the third generation battery for us. We had uh, batteries in a metal case. We went to a plastic one. And this third generation we just launched, it's integrated, integratedly made like the inside of a PC. So now you can take it apart and you can take out the modules. You can take out the battery cells. You can take off, snap off the light, snap a new light in it if the light should burn out or get cracked. And you can change out the battery motor, the, the, the battery management system plug and play. So we re 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 redesigned the inside of our battery for two reasons. Number one, to meet the UL specification, but number two, more importantly, to make it repairable. So you don't have to throw away the whole battery and get a new one. For ecological yeah. reasons, you don't want to do that. You can actually replace the components in it modularly at some point when that battery has any kind of issues with it. I think anyone who's had a smartphone uh, kind of realizes that over the course of, you know, just naturally four, five, six years of using it, hey, your battery is going to lose, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of its capacity. And I, I definitely appreciate the uh, the extra effort that you put in, because a big part of what we talk about on the show here is about e-waste and, you know, kind of just sustainability and being able to modular, uh, you know, just kind of modulate that and uh, fix it as you need is uh, huge for the right to repair. So great, uh, great that you do that. Uh, what I wanted to bring up was that battery technology has come a long way. I'm sure that you know uh, the material and the manufacturing, all that has come, you know, has come in ways that you don't even need to mention. But in the coming years. I mean, you said that there's an increased demand. More and more people are hearing about this. Uh, you know, the technology is clearly only going to get better. How do you see the space developing over the next couple of years? Because I think something that's happened uh, since smartphones became ubiquitous, uh, there were the e-scooters, e-bikes, uh, New York, uh, you know, Dallas. A lot of major cities have made big investments, or at least companies have let uh I should say cities have let companies make big investments in providing these as on like a commuter, at, you know, kind of turn by turn basis. Those are kind of going away and coming back. I don't really know the state of that. Where do you see the whole field going? Is it about fleet management or is it about individuals owning these things? I think it's both. But uh, you mentioned the word ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no question that everything electric is becoming ubiquitous with transportation. Um, whether you look at Tesla and all the other uh, copycats and followers, uh, Tesla kind of laid out the roadmap and said electric vehicles are possible because Elon Musk had the vision to say it can be done. And by the way, if you ever toured their factory there, it's well worth the tour. It, those, those cars come in, in the, the aluminum comes in on rolls and it comes out a week later as a car. I mean, they actually fabricate and make the cars made in the USA 
made here you mm-hmm. know, in, in a beautiful $5 million facility that was abandoned by General Motors and Toyota because they couldn't make it efficiently. And Elon Musk managed to take that same plant and use technology and a lot of robots. It's a combination of robots and people are building those cars there. And it's an amazing thing to see that you can actually build products here in the U.S., fabricate them here. Now, the seats come from Mexico and a lot of the components come from overseas. But the fact is, the 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 Tesla's assembled, are assembled in the U.S. Yeah, every category gets a ubiquitous brand. Okay, so if I said Uber, if I said rideshare, you'd say Uber. Even if you're going to take a lift, you'd probably say I'm calling an Uber. Mm-hmm. Nobody would pick up their phone and says I'm going to call a lift. I never heard them say it. They say I'm going to call an Uber. Now they may go to their phone and press the lift app, but they're, they they said they're calling an Uber. And every category gets that. T- Tesla is it for electric cars. Lululemon is it for uh, for yoga wear? Let's face it. Google is now Google now synonymous with search, like in the dictionary. Google, Google is to even search. Even if you're going to go to Yahoo or Bing, you say let's just go Google. You can go down the list and talk about. If I said motorcycles, you'd probably say Harley Davidson. Um, right. And so, every, and if I said coffee shop, you know, you're going to say Starbucks. And I can go down the list. But w- Pedigo is determined to be the ubiquitous brand with electric bikes because we're the only company that does business the way we do. We have 200 located, independently owned and operated shops that carry nothing but Pedigo. You can't carry, you don't carry any brands. They don't carry anything but Pedigo and accessories, much like Tesla does. The difference between us and Tesla are that Elon Musk has more money than I do, quite a bit more. And, but <laughs> um, each one of our shops is owned and operated by an, by an independent entrepreneur in that neighborhood, as opposed to a Tesla store, which you go in and buy there and you're, you know, there, there's just employees there. And I can tell you the treatment's different. Uh, my fifth Tesla's on order. I still have not seen it yet because they don't have any in the stores. And when I go in <laughs> to visit the stores, they have attitude like, just go look on the on- online. I said, no, I want to see one. No, you got to go look online. We don't have any. Like, you know, that's just not the kind of attitude that I expect when I'm buying a $100,000 car. Right. We have independently owned enough. So we're out to be the ubiquitous brand. So when people say electric bike right now in the bike industry, Pedigo is the first name to come up. We're trying to get that same mind share of the consumer. And and no, it makes perfect sense, uh, especially as hopefully this, you know, kind of uh, trend of people wanting to be outdoors. I mean, hey, if anything positive is going to come out of this pandemic, it's a, you know, a further appreciation of just the outdoors and the, uh, you know, the, these e-bikes are definitely going to uh, kind of bridge that gap for a lot of people. What are some, uh, you know, maybe potential obstacles that obviously we have immediately the chip shortage, um, you know, might be the supply chain and getting these things manufactured and shipped into the U S uh, what are some obstacles that you see, uh, for the growth of e-bikes, you know, maybe besides that, is it about getting the word out? Is it, you know, kind of price, what are some areas that you're looking to tackle going forward? Well, actually, most of the issues have been tackled. Um, now it's just a matter of scaling. So in business, it's concept, proof of concept, and scaling. So the concept is electric bicycles. The proof of concept, we can get a million people to buy electric bikes last year. That's how many electric bikes were sold in this country. The next challenge is scaling. How do we scale it? How do we get people exposed to the product? How do they get it to experience it and say, gee, I'd like one or two of these? We find customers now buying multiple electric bikes. Uh, We just did a consumer survey and 77% of our customers said they're planning to buy another Pedego electric bike, which is an astounding number. Um, So I think the obstacles sometimes the industry itself, the bike industry is anti-electric bike. Mm -hmm. Um, They're definitely anti-throttle. They they think somehow they think it's okay if you have an electric bike and you can uh, pedal it and you're required to pedal it in in order to get some energy. And that's right. called pedal assist. And that's the European standard. And they tried to exact that standard on this country. And we fought it and won successfully. And so you can you can have pedal assist technology, which is very good. And we have it on all of our products. But you can mm-hmm. also power it via throttle, like you can a motorcycle, which means you just twist it and you go. You don't have to. You can use your you, the pedals as basically foot, foot, foot pegs for you. Don't have to, but you can, and it's available to do it. Or as most people ride our bikes, they use both, a combination of the pedal assist, and when they want to get going a little faster, race through that intersection or catch up with a friend, they just give it a little bit of uh, energy on the throttle. So the industry has been anti-throttle. Uh, they disdain them. Most, almost all the big bike companies do not offer a throttle on their bike, and it's at their own demise. It's just the craziest thing in the world because somehow they think that's cheating. 
It's okay if you're pedaling, but it's not okay if you use the throttle. So I think that's really been the biggest inhibitor. They've big bar and stolen fought against the throttle technology. And like anything else, they, they're losing. I mean, you may not remember back in the day, there was Sony, which had Betamax, and there was VHS for recording. <laughs> yes. Guess who won? Beta, uh, Betamax lost. It was great technology. It was probably better technology, but it lost. The VHS became the standard for video recording. So there's other cases where an industry tried to control the public and unsuccessfully. And the same thing is happening right now in, in the bicycle industry. The, the, although they haven't given up yet, they're trying to regulate our use of our bikes out of existence and they've lost every battle. Cer certainly seems strange that they would uh, fight to reduce the features of this, you know, uh, of an e-bike instead of, you know, kind of fighting to just say, hey, you know, this bike has these features. These bikes don't have these features. You know, the more the merrier. But hey, variety doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, a, a lot of these companies strong suits. Well, now, the, the thing the thing here is that you can have both. You know, yeah, they like of course. They to choose. Our bikes, we put both pedal assist and throttle on. So the customer gets to choose. The industry doesn't get to pick what the, the customer wants. The best analogy I like to draw is like diesel station wagons. If you go to Europe, most people in Europe drive a diesel station wagon. Okay. That's just what they drive because gas is 10 bucks a gallon. And they, they you know, diesel station, you don't see too many GMC Suburbans over there or, or, or Escalades. You see diesel station wagons. Mm -hmm. um, Europe tried to bring their diesel station wagons here. It didn't work. Uh, Europe tried to bring their pedal assist 250 watt anemic bikes here. It didn't work. <laughs> and so uh, you, can, you can look outside the window all day long and you let me know how many diesel station wagons you see. Like you could wait a week and you'd never see one because there aren't any. And so pedal assist 250 watt low powered bikes are diesel station wagons. Our bikes are more like, you know, lud uh, Tesla's in ludicrous mode. You certainly picked, I think, the, the right side of this because we've already seen regulation in uh, the European Union saying that by 2035, no internal combustion vehicles can be sold. Uh, California says uh, 2030 or 2035 as well. Uh, there's a lot of deadlines kind of looming in the next decade that will see the combustion engine no longer be even available to a lot of these people. Uh, I'm not saying that the you know traditional bikes are combustion by any means, but hey, people are going to be looking for you know kind of uh, new forms of electricity electric, uh, you know, kind of commuting and, and, and things like that. So you choose well, the right side of it. And, and by the way, the trajectory of electric cars and electric bikes are following the same graph. If you look at how many electric cars were sold last year and how many electric bikes were sold compared to a uh, fossil fuel burning car and an acoustic bike, the numbers are exactly the same. <laughs> 17 million cars and light trucks were sold last year. 1 million were electric. 17 million acoustic bicycles were sold last year. 1 million were electric. So, and the trend has been going the same since I started tracking it back in 2010. They grow exactly the same point. And there's no question we're going to be predominantly electric cars 10 years from now. There's no question we'll be predominantly electric bikes. Some, some industry experts think that all, electric, all bikes will have some type of motor on them in the next 10 years and certainly mm -hmm. possible the acoustic bike could go the way of the horse and buggy and when cars mm -hmm. came out nobody thought they would replace the horse and buggy just took a number of years to do it but it, eventually it happened so one thing that uh and and you probably know this better than i do that a lot of uh companies kind of you know kind of fell into with the uh, you know kind of the fleet management and like you know the the hundreds of bikes that they put into new york city for instance things like that uh managing and refurbishing and, um, you know, dealing with, uh, batteries and, you know, replacing batteries, like the cost of maintenance and upkeep and just refurbishing these bikes over and over and over again. Is that something that the industry as a whole needs to get better at? I mean, you, you know, even you made the advancements with, uh, the modular battery design. Uh, is that something that just electric bikes need to kind of get better at? I think even Tesla is yeah, you know, so, working so on ways to swap batteries. The untold story about all this e-mobility on this rideshare basis, it's been, it's been a disaster. Um, and I mean it from a safety standpoint, and I'm more mean, and, and that's important, and I mean it from an economic standpoint. The life expectancy of all these electric vehicles in a rideshare, share-type mode is horrific. You know, I've heard as little as four weeks is the life expectancy mm. of an electric scooter. And I've heard six to eight weeks on an electric bicycle. They end up in the bottom of rivers, they end up vandalized, they end up 
being unuseful. When I first started studying um, the whole idea of, of bike share um, in 2014, I went to Madrid and they had <coughs> 1,500 bikes in their in their um, in their rideshare program. So I literally <laughs> went to Madrid to see if I thought this was a business model. And when I got there, I found plenty of bikes. Half of them in the docking stations were with their seats turned sideways. And their seat <laughs> turned sideways is the universal sign. Don't just touch this bike; it's busted. Okay. And then the three bikes that I rented, they all had mechanical issues with them. One, not one of them worked well. And I concluded that the, this particular bike share program made a huge mistake. They spent $4,000 on the docking station to dock it, and they spent mm -hmm. $1,000 on the bike. They should have done it the other way around. They should have put the quality bike. The problem is when you build this high quality bike that can take ride share abuse, you now have built a tank. And that tank is very heavy and it's no longer a bike because you can't pedal it. It's right. really just a scooter with pedals on it. So there's a real imbalance here. And I don't know what the solution is. People say, well, just make the bikes lighter. And I said, that's so easy. All we do is take the motor and the battery off of it. and It'll be really light. <laughs> so the motor and the battery, what gives it the power and the energy. And that's what weighs so much until we come up with a lightweight motor and a, and a lightweight battery. That, that, that ship isn't going to happen. And so if you want to go range, you know, the early question is how far do you go? Well, if you've got to go range, it's going to weigh, you know, it's going to weigh 10 pounds. You can't take something like this, this battery. Right. And have it weigh two pounds because there won't be any energy in it. Energy, any energy takes weight, just like a gallon of gasoline costs. So it weighs something. So in order for this to work, you got to find it. So I'm not convinced today that, that bike share, electric bike share, and or scooter share is going to work. I think the better solution, especially when it comes to scooters and even bikes, for you to own your own, take responsibility for it. Yeah. And it, then you've got to worry about where it is. We need places to park them. If it's a scooter, you can take it up to your office. If it's a bike, there should be bike garages put in garages. We're working right now to install uh, lockers in, in New York City in parking garages that will hold 18 bikes per parking space. You can put nine bikes on, on in one space, but if you go double decker, you can put 18 spots parking. So just think about that. If you're a revenue producer for a parking garage, you can get, you're not going to get the same amount to park your car there, but you only have to get one eighteenth of the price in, with a heck of a lot invest, less investment in real estate. So there's got to be a place in cities to store them. They can't be left outside. This idea that you can have a bike share and leave it outside in the elements is just nonsense, especially with electric components on it. They're not designed for that. It's not a car where it's completely encased. And if it does, it's such a heavy product that it's really a scooter, not a bike. Right. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it really gets to the point where, like you said, for, you know, four, six, eight weeks for these devices. And let's face it, at that point, they're almost disposable. And that's, uh, that's really, really they're difficult. too expensive to do that though. They're too yeah. Expensive. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so owning your own, and even though there is some investment, you know, looking through your bikes, I saw, uh, you know, some started like what was it, two thousand, all the way up to you know four, four, five thousand. Our, uh, our, our 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 basic entry level bike is eighteen ninety five pedigree element, go. great value for the money, forty volt, forty eight volt, ten amp hours. I think it'll take you thirty five to 40, 40 miles on a charge. Get a longer range battery is an option. Our most expensive is our fifty four ninety five full suspension mountain bike, um, the Elevate. And everything's in between it. To get a good value electric bike, you really got to pay about three thousand dollars, and you want to get a long term warranty. Most of our bikes have a five year warranty on, it, including the battery. Uh, I don't think a single competitor has, offers a five year warranty. We've been in business since two thousand eight. I can fix any bike we've ever sold back to two thousand eight. We've got the repair parts, we've got the batteries, we've got anything you need to do. If you buy a bike online, you pay cheap. And two or three years, the battery craps out. The not ch good chance you won't be able to get one. You right. then have a very heavy bike that won't have a motor <laughs> that you can access. You've got to be able to have a battery that's going to operate. Yeah, and and uh, I think another thing that uh, since we're comparing you know comparing this to Tesla so much, uh, one thing that Tesla did very well was that people would see Teslas, especially early on, and you know know that the early ones were a hundred thousand uh, dollars. They would look at these and go, "Oh, I want to key this. I want to scratch this. You know, uh, they get hit that kind of thing." Tesla had some very good security features. Uh, 
bikes get vandalized, you know, either they get tire stolen, seat stolen, whatever. Uh, are there any kind of protections you've put in place? You know, maybe is it tagged with Bluetooth? Is it, uh, you know, it, does it have kind of a lock with the battery? I mean, what kind of anti kind of tampering theft kind of things do you have? If people so take the, these things the into thing town. The thing that we've discovered is if you're going to, if you're a thief and you're determined to steal a bike, you can steal it and you can overcome the electronics that are on it. And so we, we, we offer a very heavy duty lock, which is the best theft protection you can have. Mm-hmm. If the thief sees one bike with a, with a very good lock on it and a bike with a cheap lock, which do you think he's going to go after? He's going to take the one, cheap yeah. lock. So what we do is we offer a five-year anti-theft program. If your bike gets stolen and it has our lock on it, we will give you a brand new bike. You really want your bike back after somebody stole it? You really <laughs> want to go to somebody's house and find it? I think yeah. this idea of tracking your bike and you're going to track yourself to the thieves den and you're going to go there and you're going to go there and you're going to say, Hey, give me back my bike. And the reality is you're not going to get the police to go get it because you yeah. can't prove it's there and you can't prove the guy stole it. So this idea of tracking my bike, I think is just absurd. It just doesn't have any practical sense. It sounds good in theory, but in practical, if somebody cuts through the lock at your bike and you know, you've parked it outside your, your, your school or your, or, or your, your work, and it's gone, you should kiss that bike goodbye and go figure out either get insurance to pay for it or in the case of our bikes to get Pedigo to buy you a new one. And I buy new ones all the time because sometimes they actually cut through the very thorough locks we have because there's some pretty smart thieves out there with some really good Makita saws that can cut through those uh, yeah. as good as that chain is. The bike's going to get stolen. It is a problem. You, you, gotcha. you keep it in a safe place as best you can. When it's out in the public, could have put a good lock on it and then the backup policy is that if it's a pedigo and it gets stolen, we're going to give you a brand new one. Uh, that and, and really, that's very uh, you know amazing how much you've really highlighted that you stand behind these products. Um, you know, obviously a premium, but hey, uh, you're you're going to get your value out of that. So you've you've really did a good job of highlighting that, Don. Uh, let's talk about real quick, and then we're going to start wrapping this up. But I want to talk about the uh, major changes. You know, we talked about some stuff in the future and how that's going to develop. But you've you know really put a lot of uh, uh, a lot of respect to how Tesla produces their, you know, their cars and things like that. Uh, it almost sounds like you really would like that kind of production in the U S uh, for electric bikes. Is that something that you see? Um, you know, how do you see the future manufacturing of these bikes changing in the coming years? Well, very naively, when I started Pedigo in 2008, I really believed I was going to find a way to make electric bikes in the U S and I was as naive as you could come. And the reality is nobody's been able to do it. Probably nobody will in the foreseeable future for one very important reason. There's not a single component that's made in the U.S. that goes on the bike. Hmm. You can't buy a spoke, a seat, a handlebar, a stem, a tire, a tube. Go down the whole list. There's 52 (laughs) items on a bill of materials. Not one is made in the U.S. Now, the secret would be if we could make frames here, okay? Because the frame, without the frame, you don't have a bike. And, and literally, if I could make frames here, we could probably get suppliers to start making some of the other components. But the reality is, is there's, it's so capital intensive. The business all morphed from the US to, to Asia in the 90s and into 2000 and not any single bike. Now, people claim they make bikes here, but they're really just assembling them. And if you could say you assembled it here, well, then Walmart, if they put the bike together, they could say the bike was made in the US if they put it together. And what does put it together mean? Put some, you know, put something on. You need 50% of the componentry to be home-based in order to qualify for made Mm. in America. We couldn't get to 2%, let alone 50%. It's impossible. So we could assemble them here, but the labor cost in Asia is a dollar an hour. In California, it's more like $50 an hour. So we could certainly assemble our bikes here, but it would be cost prohibitive and people wouldn't pay the extra price you know, if I said our bike is eighteen ninety five, but we make it here in the U.S. and it's twenty eight ninety five, what do you think the customers are going to pick? Yeah, it's uh, the, the, and you know, certain price points are like if you can hit certain price points, that's going to be the biggest motivator, you know, bar none. So, what were some of the major, you know, kind of changes to production? Like, like are you predicting no major changes to uh, to these things? No, no, being no made? Well, well, so first of all, we have to understand that the, 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 what the bike is. Okay, the bike, a bicycle. Is two t- two wheels, three on a tricycle, uh, pedals, a handlebar, and a seat. Okay, now you can add all the electronic gizmo and gadgetry you wanted, but 
A lot of people buy a bike just for the recreation. We sell a ton of phone holders. We came out with our own phone holder because we didn't like the phone holders that everybody had out there. Right. And we came up with a great phone holder. But you know what? We don't sell very many because the customers tell us they don't want to have their phone when they're out riding their bike. They're out for recreation. They don't want to take phone calls. Um, so they want to carry stuff. They want to carry their purse or their lunch or they want to carry, um, you know, uh, their, uh, their, you know, maybe a bottle of wine something to stop and have a picnic, lots of things they want to get, want to carry their kids on the back. So we come out with accessories that we think are very appropriate. We're launching a whole new line of accessories based on customer demand. The biggest one is the bike covers. We've got single and dual bike covers for people who are hauling them around on the back of their, hmm. their, their, their vehicle um, so that they can um, uh, you know, go and explore places. Hand grips are a big thing. People want a comfortable hand grip. A customer touches, a consumer touches the bike three places. They, they hand grips. We've got soft and squishy, comfortable hand grips. Mm -hmm. They have a seat. We have not only regular nice cushy seats, but we also offer a memory foam seat if you want a super comfortable seat. And then on top of that, the pedals. And the pedals are more important about the positioning rather than your comfort on them because usually they're insulated by a shoe or a sneaker. Right. But it's where the pedals are. So you can ride a bike sitting upright. Or every every inch you lean forward is less comfortable for a lot of people and more stress on your shoulders and your back and your neck and your wrists and all that. If you sit upright like you are in a chair, you're in a perfect riding position to our way of thinking. To a cyclist way of thinking, that's blasphemy. You need to be <laughs> leaning down and looking at the ground in the most uncomfortable uncom position you could imagine. You've because that's how you're going to get yeah. air, air dynamic efficiency, and that's where you're going to reduce the drag. It's not true with an electric bike because you don't need to be down low. You need to be up, full upward where you can see and be seen. If you think about your range of motion, when you turn your head left to right, you can see plenty. If you're looking down at the ground, you turn left to right, you're just looking at the side. You're not going to see behind you. So the position of the pedal has a lot to do with it. It's called the geometry of the bike. And we spend a lot of time on the geometry part of it. Gotcha. So as far as technological advances coming down the road, don't really see them. We've got new battery technology coming out, the 27700 cells. So we've had 18650s up until now. We now have, I think they're 27700 or 27. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a, a more compact, dense cell. We can get more energy in the battery. So what we used to have is a 17.5 volt uh, uh, amp hour capacity. We can go to 20 in the same case. When we first came out with this plastic case, we can only get 10 amp hour in it. Now, because of battery technology, we can now get 20 amp hour in it, which means hmm. we can double the range. That's about as far we're going to go. And it's not going to get any better than that because it's chemistry. It's not like it's technology. Everybody thinks it's a bike as a technological product. Right. When it comes to the battery, it's really not technology. It's chemistry. We can't change the chemistry. The chemistry is the chemistry. What we can change is, is, is the, the efficiency of it. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, you know, we even did a segment a couple months ago about the uh, why don't we have better battery technology? You know, why is lithium ion still the king? And yeah, we did a whole hour long segment on, like you said, it's just chemistry. You, you can't, uh, you know, until they come out with uh, better chemicals and, you know, better elements. Hey, we're we are squeezing every little bit of efficiency out of lithium uh, lithium ion as we can, and luckily, like you said, hey, year over year they're getting better and they're getting more efficient, and just everything's. Uh, I think some of the best news we heard last month was that uh, they were testing lithium ion recycling technology, and they found they like. Uh, like 99% efficiency in recycling lithium ion batteries. It, and that was great to hear. It just means that, hey, they're going to be around launching, for longer. We're launching our recycling program uh, in two weeks at our dealer meeting. And it's basically, they're going to, the batteries will get turned in back to the shops. They'll get sent to a recycler and the recycler will recycle everything they possibly can out of that battery. But we're trying to minimize that by having the, the, the batteries be uh, reusable, the case and the components in it. We still got to find a way though, the cells when they're depleted to get reused. Right. Yeah. And, and, and hey, that's uh, that's all coming down uh, the road. So, uh, Don, uh, we, of course, have our usual audience, which is, you know, very, uh, you know, kind of uh, consumer electronics minded. That's great. Uh, another portion of our audience, there are also a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, people who have their own businesses and, you know, kind of do that whole thing. Uh, you seem like you are very passionate, not just about e-bikes, but of course, about growing your business and just being, you know, kind of successful where others have 
failed before you. I wanted you, you know, before we say goodbye, wrap up the interview, I wanted to see if you had any kind of words of wisdom for people who, you know, you turned one shop into, like you said, you're hoping, I think, close to 200 different retailers. Uh, well, yeah, we, have two, we have 200, we have 200 now, but yeah. I, I want to turn into a thousand. And the, the thing is, in the whole time we've been doing this since 2012, we've had exactly one failure out of 200 shops. And to me, that's pretty incredible because the likelihood of a new business surviving today depending on the statistics you look like, you've got about a 20% chance of surviving five or two years. And mm-hmm. you got like a 2% of surviving five years. Our business model is just the opposite. That My proudest accomplishment with Pedigo is making 200 people entrepreneurs that weren't in the past. They were displaced by corporate America. They want to do something fun, something they enjoyed and something that was giving back to society. And there's nothing more fun than owning a Pedigo shop in your local town. And we still got plenty of room for more, but That'll be the real foundation of Pedigo uh, as time goes on, where you get local service and you get that local owner that's involved in the community and donating bikes to charity and, and, and doing right things in the community as opposed to buying one randomly online from some company in Timbuktu. Right. No, very, very well said. And uh, yeah, it really, everything that you've said here today, uh, I'll let you have uh, any kind of closing statements. Uh, anything that we didn't touch on, highlight uh, that you want to mention real quick? I just encourage anybody that would is interested in going out and having some fun and some recreation and get uh, get help you both physically and mentally to go out and rent a pedigo at one of our 200 locations. Just go rent one. Go try one. If you don't even want to rent one, just say you want to take a test drive. That's free. Kind of like a rental car. You can go drive one around the block to see if it's right for you. If you <laughs> like it, rent one. If you like it further than that, buy it. But the most important advice I can get, try one on before you buy it to make sure. If you get the wrong size or the wrong style, you're not going to use it. It'll be like a an overweight uh, 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 piece of exercise equipment in your garage. Right. Yeah, no. And, and of course, uh, once again, P-E-D-E-G-O.com. You can check it out there. And they have a find the store uh, right up there in the upper right if you want to find one near you. And of course, you can check out all their bikes right there on the site. Uh, like the nice people over at the Tesla store told you, just go look at it online. Uh, but no, please go on and say hi, uh, say hi to these uh, lovely people. And everyone, we've been talking to uh, Don. He is the CEO of Pedigo Electric Bikes. Don, your insight has been, uh, once again, this, like, like e-bikes have been a topic on the show before. Uh, you've given us some insight that we've never had before. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the program. It was my pleasure, Ben. I'm, I'm happy to come back anytime you want me. Hey, uh, yeah, definitely going to take you up on that. Uh, quick question. Are you going to be out, uh, presenting at CES or any presence out there at the show? Probably not. It's really not our fit. Um, I will be attending You'd be surprised. personally. You'd yeah, be surprised. I know. I, in yeah. fact, there's a there's an e-bike test track that somebody's promoting too, but uh, it's a possibility, but our business model is really targeted on the consumer and that's really a trade show. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. No, no. Um, and perfect there. So just wondering because, you know, we're going to be covering CES. So I wanted to see if we could stop by and say hi, but Hey, we had you here on before CES and everyone, uh, the interview is going to be available forever on the podcast. It's going to be up on the homepage for the next 10 days or so. And Don, I want to thank you so much for coming on and, uh, yeah, looking forward to having you back on. Thank you, Ben. All right, perfect. So everyone, we're going to go ahead and kind of wrap it up, uh, wrap that up there. Uh, once again, ComputerAmerica.com. And until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. And hey, we'll be back more Computer America Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye bye.